going to tell you a little bit tonight about an explorer called John Ross, whose name has all but been forgotten nowadays, but who was very important because he led the very first uh, voyage of scientific exploration into the Arctic. But he and his crew went missing and they stayed away for four years. And this was in the days before there was even rubber boots or waterproof fabrics or tinned food. And I thought, how, the, how did they manage that? And they did come back and all but two of the crew survived the journey. And the main purpose of his voyage was to look for the Northwest Passage, um, a new shipping route through to the other side of the world. And he was going on behalf of the British government who offered a huge prize for anybody who could discover where the Northwest Passage was. John Ross had had a distinguished career in the Navy during the, 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 the Napoleonic Wars. But when peace broke out, he was unemployed, as were lots of other sailors. And the government decided it would be good to send people with a lot of experience off to unmapped and unexplored areas to see what they could find and learn more um, about the world. But uh, he didn't find the Northwest Passage on this occasion, but he did find the exact location of the magnetic North Pole, which was different from the North Pole that was drawn onto maps. The North Pole drawn on maps was right above London, the centre of the British Empire, of course. But the magnetic North Pole is actually off the coast of Canada. And people at that time couldn't understand why the compass needle was going all over the place and not pointing where they thought it should. And this led to lots of accidents. So his discovery of the exact location of the magnetic North Pole led to a huge advance in navigation safety and saved countless thousands of lives at sea. And he also showed that it is actually possible for people to live in the Arctic, which was considered a sterile frozen wasteland at that time. And he learnt survival skills that enabled those that came after him to indeed find the Northwest Passage and to show how to live in those regions. And I became aware of John Ross a few years ago and became interested and hooked by what his story had to tell because I'd survived and endured a journey of my own. Ten years ago, almost to the day, I was given a diagnosis of an incurable cancer and I was told that I could be weeks away from death and that a course of chemotherapy could give me a few years possibly five, if it worked. So I was catapulted into this world of strong drugs and side effects and files of complicated medical information which sometimes went missing and alternative therapies and lots of broccoli. But eventually my bone marrow and my blood started to behave as they should. And I was told that I was getting better, but I felt terribly physically weak. And I could hardly even turn myself over in bed and felt dreadful. Every little task was an enormous hurdle. So I began to feel I wanted to make the most of whatever bit of time I had left and wasn't really feeling I was getting stronger by myself. So I went to a personal trainer and he had a look and a think and he was a specialist in getting athletes back to fitness after injury. Well, I was never an athlete, but he said he would get me running. And although I thought it was highly unlikely, I agreed to go along with him and we started doing gentle exercises and I straight away discovered that doing exercise does give you energy. And then I had cognitive problems to deal with, what patients know as chemo brain. 
and it's very difficult to concentrate and to remember things and to complete tasks and even reading and talking seem very hard when you're like that. So I wanted something to help me retrain my brain. And there was a senior learners programme here at Lancaster University aimed at older people. And so I picked a short course about Galileo because I'd been to Pisa once on holiday and I knew he was born there and thought it would be good to learn about a period of history that I knew nothing about. So that learning took me to the Greenwich Maritime Museum and I was looking at telescopes and early instruments and saw this portrait of Sir John Ross and I thought he looks a bit like my dad. I wonder if we're related. And he remembered my dad teaching me to read and making me find the word Ross on the map. And there was Ross Island and Ross Ice Shelf and a few other features. I thought, well, it really was time to find out who John Ross was. And John Ross went sailing into the Arctic in 1829. And he was using a traditional wooden sailing ship, all brass and polish and big white sails. But steam technology was beginning to develop at that time, so he thought it would be a good idea to install a steam engine and have paddles on the side of the ship that could add manoeuvrability for going amongst icebergs and not relying too much on the wind. And he did get further than anybody else had been before. But following a relatively warm summer, a very early winter set in and the ice and the sea started to freeze around the ships and they became trapped. But it didn't seem too bad. They had plenty of food and fuel and they would just stay over winter and wait for the ice to melt the following year. So he set about doing everything he could to protect the mental and physical well-being of the men. They kept their living quarters clean and tidy. They had daily and weekly routines so that every day didn't seem to be the same. Um, they worshipped on Sundays. They put their best clothes on and read the Bible to each other. And in the evenings, they read stories to each other and the more educated members of the crew gave reading and writing lessons to the others. They took regular exercise and they cut down on alcohol. And then, most interestingly, a group of Inuit people came to the ship who'd been living entirely isolated in the Arctic on their own, not aware that there was any other people. And this is a, a watercolour painting of their first meeting. This was before photography, so we have to rely on what people managed to get down on paper. And it shows the crew from the ship going towards the Inuit and putting their guns down on the ground. And trying to show that there were peaceful intentions. But it was a tense moment until they noticed that one of the Inuit men had lost part of his leg below the knee. So immediately the ship's carpenter made him a wooden leg, carved the name of the ship, the victory on it, and fitted it to his stump. And the Inuits were absolutely delighted with this. And it helped the two groups to make friends and get along together. So John Ross studied the Inuit. He learnt their language. He observed their lifestyle and their habits. And he realised that they were eating a very high-fat diet, using animal skins for clothing, and that they had ways of dealing with moisture, which can get on the skin and freeze and cause severe burns and death very quickly. Now, the Navy rules that most European sailors 
uh, well, British sailors were living by, dictated matters of hierarchy and the chain of command, but also food and drink and clothing. And they were the same, whether you were in the tropics or in colder climates, and John Ross realised that they had to change and adopt the ways of the Inuit. And it was a big step because questioning the Navy rules carried severe penalties and even death. But he did it. And it began to seem to me as I found out more about him that our journeys had a few things in common. Setting off into the unknown without a proper map to tell you what's going to happen and where you're going. No, no certainty about a day of coming back to normal. And having to learn new skills and adapt to a new situation. And finding out that if you're really stuck, you have to make a plan and get out. And Ray Mears, uh, who's a well-known explorer and outdoor survival expert, says that when you're stuck, if you just take one step towards getting out of that difficult situation, you're massively better off psychologically to take the next step and the next. And that's what John Ross did. He made his plan to get out because the following year the ice didn't melt and the following year it didn't melt again. And after three years in the Arctic, he told his men at Christmas that they were going to abandon the ship and walk across the ice in the hope of being rescued by a fishing ship. And the whole crew did that walk, carrying as much in the way of supplies as they could, and it took them 16 months. But eventually, they were seen by the Isabella from Hull. And this is a painting of the little canoes paddling up to the Isabella and the men on the Isabella climbing into the rigging and giving the men three cheers when they realised that these people who they thought were lost forever were back. So they returned to England to a hero's welcome after John Ross made his plan, took his first step and got back home. And for me, that first step was to begin exercising and building up enough strength and stamina to come back to university and learn something new. Because being retired from work, paid work, doesn't mean retiring from life. And if you're learning something new, life has purpose and meaning. And sharing that meaning is very motivating and stimulating and you're never too old. And I don't know if you can see the 90th birthday cake here. And George is here in the audience here supporting me tonight. <laughs> so I, it was suggested by my personal trainer that I'll do some new sports, some real activity, get out of the house and away from just doing little routines with him and reading about John Ross and all the canoeing and, and being out on the water, I thought that would be something that I might like to try. And the Students' Union has a canoeing club, so I joined them. And in no time at all, I was upside down in the River Loon on a cold November afternoon. And my consultant wasn't desperately pleased about that, but hey, it's my life. It was great fun, and I was getting stronger and fitter. And then the senior learners program shut down, so a few of us uh, volunteered to keep a program going, and we run lunchtime lectures, we support each other in study, a couple of people have done PhDs and written books, and another lady's restored a overgrown cemetery and turned it into a wildlife haven and we have a research circle and we've taken part in a lot of projects and research uh, projects around the university and that's a lot of that is on our website so then through this learning community I learned about 
a dragon boat group for cancer survivors and I joined them. We meet on Windermere at Lowood Bay and last year we were invited to take part in the Queen's Jubilee flotilla. And dragon boating for, particularly for women with cancer, was started by an oncologist in Canada who looked at the advice that is often given to people to cut down on their activities and not to do heavy lifting and definitely no canoeing and thought, where's the evidence for this? And there wasn't any. So he persuaded a group of women to see if the opposite was true and people should be doing more exercise. And guess what? It is true. And the evidence for the benefits of exercise across all cancers is really growing and catching up with the medicine. So we wait to see what the future holds on that. So my cancer journey led me back into my education journey and my discovery of John Ross, possible distant relative, and all the things that I could learn as a cancer survivor from him as an explorer. And next weekend, it's midsummer, and uh, hundreds of us are going to be paddling the whole of Lake Wy Windermere. It's about 10 miles, and it seems a great way to celebrate surviving 10 years of living with cancer and there will be cake. <laughs> but especially the most important thing I've learned is that learning is for life. Thank you. <laughs>